All right, so let's go ahead and start. Five ways to fail in online teaching. So first, I wanna kind of start with the definition of failure. So I really like this quote by Samuel Beckett, um, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. And I love this quote just because it turns failure into um, part of a process. I think that when we think about failure, um, especially with someone who has anxiety, hi, hello, um, that's me, um, and some of you out there probably have the same issue, with failure, there's a real fear of failure. Um, there's a fear of being a failure. It's like being a failure is this kind of permanent state that really sucks. And it's this fear of failure that kind of keeps us from moving forward. It keeps us from learning new things. I feel like the, the fear of failure has prevented more things than it has created. Um, so if you do fail at something like online teaching, never fear. Um, it's just part of a process. So we're here today to talk about how we can fail again, try again, and fail better in the future. So I want you to take a moment and use the chat function and go ahead and type into the chat, what is one way that you felt that you failed at online teaching? Um, and by failure, I mean, um, what's a problem or a situation that you had that you feel like you didn't succeed at? Um, and let's go ahead and share that in the chat. And then I'll go ahead and read those and move on. So go ahead and share your experience in the chat, please. We have a couple of responses, so I'm going to go ahead and address those. So uh, Carrie says that the first day she moved way, way too fast. It was nerves. I used Blackboard Collaborate. I can definitely identify with that. Um, it's taken a lot of years and a lot of practice for me to kind of, you know, find the moments to breathe in between, and I get really excited about stuff, and I tend to go really, really fast. Um, Dorothy said not sending out an introduction video. That's definitely um, something that I didn't do with online uh, teaching, something I've never really done with online teaching. I always say that I'm gonna do it, and I rarely do. Um, I could not, so Erin says, I could not keep up with content as fast as I think students were ready to learn it. That's a really good problem to have. Um, and then Johnny said, handle face-to-face -face conference with students online, that can be very challenging, definitely. Um, Mary Jo says, failed at building community between students. That's something that is really, really challenging. It's not just about, teaching the materials about building a learning community. And we'll talk about some ways to do that today. Um, keeping students engaged in the class, that's a big thing. Um, a lot of students will just kind of fall off the map and just kind of disappear. And we don't know what happens to them. Um, lot, losing the connection with students, that's definitely hard when you move to an online environment, but there are ways to maintain that instructor present and, and to keep students engaged. Um, failed to use the discussion board successfully. I definitely identify with that. We have a couple of comments on discussion boards. Didn't moderate the discussion boards, just let the students do it on their own. It's kind of easy with an online class, especially when you're not used to putting in the extra effort to just kind of set it and forget it and let it run by itself and not kind of moderate it. Um, you shouldn't be responding to every kind of student post, that would be insane. But there are ways to uh, address what's going on in the student discussion, like in an announcement, you know, by saying, oh, I, a lot of you guys have been discussing X in the discussion board, and it was nice to see Y, essentially. Um, Jenny says it's her first semester teaching online. Welcome to the madness, Jenny. Uh, we're, we're very happy to have you. Um, and then Keith says for his very first class, he had all the assignments due on Friday with the expectations that they would be done throughout the week. And then they had 96 items to grade on Saturday. So that's fun. Uh, oh, and please make sure your microphones are muted because we can get some background noise and uh, that can be distracting. So discussion, uh, Noor Jahan says, I don't do it. <laughs> and I definitely understand that it can be, um, whenever we're teaching 
face to face in a class, we get that face to face component. And it's like, okay, this is what I'm doing. Uh, I'm discussing with them. It's much harder when there's an online component to it. So I kind of understand and, and resonate with all of what you said. I also want to share a couple of these. Uh, I asked this question in a Facebook group that I'm a part of that's for teachers. It's called Pandemic Pedagogy. And I just want to kind of share some of their responses and see if they kind of resonate with yours. So um, I asked what they failed at. I asked what their failure was. And they said, um, one person said, trying to do videos like lectures freehand, and then they had to start scripting, um, not asking my students what they wanted, not taking it one day at a time, not communicating. Uh, one person said, accepting unlimited late work, like apparently they had students who were taking advantage or who tried to do the entire class in the last week. Um, not collaborating with other teachers. Somebody else said that they overcompensated for the move to online with more work, which, act, which actually ended up overwhelming students and then um, overwhelming the instructor because they had all that grading to do. Um, and also somebody said embedding podcasts without realizing that hearing impaired students wouldn't have access. So there are questions of accessibility. And when we moved to online, uh, we basically held everything together with floss and duct tape. Um, so this next semester, we have a real opportunity to think about what we want to teach and how we want to teach it and be more thoughtful in how we design our courses for our students. A couple of other things that stood out to me from these comments were I failed at trying to be perfect uh, and making everything maximally best according to a massive onslaught of webinars, um, blogs, and pedagogy handbooks because I think what happened is when we, we did the move to online we were just bombarded with information from our, our, our college um, and I love that, that this person says, I can't do everything, neither can students. They have to remember that good enough teaching has to be enough. Um, and that also applies to this other um, response that I got, which is too much grading. So I think we kind of have all these cool ideas in our head of what we want to do, but we also have to think of assessment. Um, and then also uh, low stakes assignments that students can do that are not going to be um, thoroughly graded, but give students an opportunity to kind of fail and to learn. So the first way, so based on this um, and based on kind of my own experience teaching, I've been teaching online for three years now, I would say that the number one way to fail at online teaching is to not communicate. <laughs> so in order to do that, you need to explain your expectations to your students. And when you do that in writing, it can be really uh, challenging because I think a lot of the writing that we do um, is for audiences other than our students. So if you look at kind of your syllabus, a syllabus becomes kind of like a, it starts off as a snowball but as we go along, it kind of rolls down this hill and it accumulates, you know, more information from your department, from your own experience, and it becomes, becomes this catch-all document. It becomes this giant snow boulder that is very hard to read. And we can't accurately kind of uh, communicate to students what our expectations are. And sometimes this means sitting down and thinking, well, what are my expectations? Do I need to adjust my expectations for the reality of teaching? So you want to make sure that you do that in a way that is simple, that students can understand. I always like, um, you know, showing the stuff that I write for my classes to other people and asking them, does this make sense? Um, because if it doesn't make sense to the student, then it doesn't work. Um, you also want to maintain an instructor presence. There are a couple ways you can do that in your class. So you, what you want to do is you want to send out weekly announcements. Um, I do that every week on the first day of the week and the last day of the week. And like the first day of the week is just telling them, giving them their list of things that they have to do that week. And then the, the email that's the last day of the week kind of wraps up what they did that week and what they learned and kind of what I'm seeing in their discussion and their assignments. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to have emails with students and let them know what's going on. Um, office hours are also a great opportunity to communicate with your students. Um, so you can have those in Blackboard Collaborate or Google Meet. Um, we ask that you don't use Zoom because Zoom, it does not, uh, you logged in, it doesn't verify who you are based on a, an account. 
um, like Google Meet or Blackboard Collaborate does. So make sure that you're using those two. Of the two, I really like Meet, but we can talk about that later, uh, or Google Meet. Um, you want to do timely grading and also feedback to your students. So those are ways you can maintain an instructor presence. Like I said, it's really tempting to kind of just do the work beforehand and just let the class run, but it's kind of like a garden. It needs, it needs kind of constant maintenance. Um, another thing uh, in terms of communication is you want to ask for help. And so make sure you guys, if you're in uh, the, the session with us, that you want to make sure that you're muted because um, we can get a kind of that feedback um, and, and background noise. So you definitely want to ask for help. Uh, I am terrible <laughs> at asking for help. I think it goes back to the idea of failure is that we don't want to be seen by people that we look up to as being less than. And we feel like by looking for help or seeking help that we are going to give them that idea of ourselves. So you definitely wanna ask for help. I like to create a support system. So I will get with my dean, I'll get with my chair, I'll get to know the admins. Admins are the backbone of most departments, so definitely get to know them. Uh, fellow instructors, that's really important. Also instructional designers. Uh, I love instructional designers because I'm kind of the subject matter expert and then they think about how best to deploy the information and how best to get students to engage with the information. Um, librarians are fantastic. I have, I, most of my friends are librarians. <laughs> so also academic coordinators like myself, you have one at every campus. So get to know them and kind of create a support network where if you have a question, um, you're not depending on one person to answer all those questions. You have a kind of wide range of people that you can go to. Um, also, you have the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I have their email here. It's faculty.support at tccd.edu. If you contact them with an issue with teaching or even a technology issue, um, they will get back to you and schedule a short one-on-one -on -one session with you um, to address your problem. So those are some of the things under don't communicate. So the second uh, way that you can fail at online teaching is not to prep your course. So I struggle with this because I definitely try to plan my course according to some, some kind of plan, but sometimes I'll get behind and I'll just be building the course while I'm teaching it. And that's not good because the time that I spend building the course while I'm teaching it takes away from my ability to engage with students. Because with online teaching, I thought, oh, I'm just gonna build it and then I'm gonna grade. That's gonna be it. No, you have to build it, you have to grade it, and you have to engage with students. That's a whole other step. And it took me like a year or two to really understand that. So with prepping your course, you wanna organize intuitively. You wanna scaffold learning activities, provide examples, and then also add visual interest. So we're gonna go over um, each of these. So when it comes to organizing intuitively, you want to organize things in a way that makes sense. <laughs> and that will make sense to not just you, but to your students. So here is an example from a current course that I do, which is the boot camp, which is coming up next week. You can register in the Learn Center and we go over how to build your Blackboard course from the ground up. So here I have a start here. That's where they're gonna go to start here. And it has a welcome video and it has a, a list of expectations for the class, what we're gonna do day by day. Um, with lessons, that's where they can go to actually access the daily lessons. So I've organized these by day, but you might organize them by week. And that's usually what I do with my um, online classes, which are usually eight weeks. I'll just have three, or sorry, eight um, lesson plans organized by the week. Um, I also have things like office hours. Um, they can access my YouTube channel. They can access their grades. And then they can also evaluate the course. So when you're thinking about how to intuitively design your course, um, think about you as a student coming in, what's going to make the most sense. You don't want to bury things in folders um, if it's for a major assignment, you know, put it on that main landing page for students to find um, and just kind of think about that and uh, have somebody else look at it, you know, because um, you may think that you're organizing intuitively for you, but it might not be for the students. So have somebody else look at it and be like, does this make sense? Um, I think we should be sharing as much as possible when we develop. I think we need to fight against that fear of failure 
uh, feeling um, because it kind of robs us of the ability to kind of reiterate things and get better. So we need to share as much as possible. Okay, so in the chat, what I want you to do is um, I want you to put the following lessons in the order you would scaffold them. So scaffolding is when you teach one concept and then you build on that concept and then you continue building throughout the semester. So go ahead and look at these topics and these lessons and put them in the order that you would scaffold them. So go ahead and do that in the chat now. Okay, we have enough responses, so I'll go through these. Um, <laughs> Aaron says, is this for an English course? No clue. <laughs> Maybe thesis, pre-write, intro, quoting, conclusion. Um, so yeah, your knowledge of the course material is going to make uh, a real difference when it comes to this. But thankfully, you are a subject matter expert, so you know the material and you know how it's going to make most sense. So a lot of you, I see intro, pre-writing, thesis, quoting, and conclusion. I mean, that's definitely one way to do it. And none of these are wrong, necessarily. Um, I do like Carrie Sullivan's response, the pre-writing, because I feel like the pre-writing has to come first. And then the thesis statements, quoting, and then Carrie has intro and conclusion together. And that might make more sense just because uh, the intro often uh, echoes the conclusion. And I still don't know how to write a good conclusion to this day. And I'm, I teach English. Um, so, <laughs> so maybe I need to take this course. Um, but yeah, conclusions are really hard, Carrie. They really are. It's kind of like, uh, what's the preacher's maxim? You tell them what you're going to tell them. You tell them and then you tell them what you told them. Um, but then that gets kind of boring and you're not supposed to introduce new information, whatever. It's, it's a different problem. Um, but yeah, so none of these are necessarily wrong. It's kind of what makes sense to you um, and will hopefully make sense to students. One way I like doing this is I'll scaffold whatever and um, in the description for the next lesson, I'll be like, okay, last, you know, lesson we learned about thesis statements. Today we're going to learn about quoting sources and you kind of build it on that because um, you can't expect a student to write a paper without understanding what a thesis statement is and you can't expect a student to write a paper without knowing what an introduction is. So kind of think about that when you're structuring your course. Think about what are the building blocks that my students need for this bit or this lesson plan? Um, what do they need to learn before they can tackle that because um, if they don't understand the building blocks and kind of the vocabulary, that's something you need to cover. So good job, everybody. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is adding visual interest. You can do this in a variety of ways. Um, you could do it by adding pictures, um, graphic design type things, but I, uh, you can also do it by uh, kind of following the graphic design principles, which are C-R-A-P, crap. <laughs> so contrast is what you want to do is you want to have um, something that's high contrast on a darker background, so something light. So you can see in my, in my PowerPoint slides, um, I've made sure to use a white 
text on a darker colored background. If I did a black text on this background, it would be really hard to read because of contrast. Repetition is repeating design elements. So if you have a syllabus, um, you're going to use a particular um, font for the, the headings, maybe bold the headings, and you repeat that design element and that tells your students, okay, every time the text appears like this, it's going to be a heading. Um, alignment, you want to left align things just because it's easier for the eye to read. And then proximity is you want to group things together that are related. Um, and you want to keep things that are not related apart. So go ahead and look at these two syllabi that I have here. So these two syllabi have the exact same content, word for word. Which one um, has better uh, visual interest and why? So go ahead and take to the chat and let me know, is it, uh, is it syllabus number one or syllabus number two? So syllabus number one is on the left, syllabus number two is on the right. Which do you think has better visual design and why? So we have some responses. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, uh, um, kind of read what you have. So almost unanimously, it's syllabus number two. And the reason are, or the reasons that it's more, it's more accessible, it's designed better, is because the author has used uh, font um, and also bolding to make the court the heading stand out so with this we have basic editing pr principles and we have all the information right but it's far harder to kind of dig into this first syllabus to find the information so because because course the the course headings look exactly alike so you see here course textbooks materials but we have course textbooks materials here and somebody said that it's easier to scan so that's really important because you have students that are reading this online. Sometimes they're reading it on their, on their cell phones and they need to be able to easily scan and get to the information. They don't want to read all the course information before, hey, I need to know what textbook there is and I need to know which textbook to get. Um, so yeah, so it's much easier to read, reasons mentioned above. You can quickly identify where information is. So visual design is much more than, it, it's not the, quite the same as graphic design. People think like, oh, I have to learn Photoshop and I have to learn how to put fancy pictures into things. It's definitely not that. Visual design is just those principles that we talked about, um, CRAP crap. So uh, things with, um, so uh, contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. And then the second syllabus does a really great job of that. If you want to learn more about how to design your syllabus, um, a syllabus that students will actually read, you can go ahead and look in the Learn Center. And I think that, that, uh, that I'm giving that training um, in two weeks. So you can kind of join us for that. But thank you guys for your work. OK. So another way to fail in online teaching is to not take the student's perspective. Um, so you want to write and design with students in mind, and I've talked a little bit about this. Um, you want to write from the perspective of the student. Really think about the student as your audience and what information they need to know. So much of the writing we do for our courses is 
for us. It's to kind of protect us <laughs> and to guard against um, particular situations that we've seen in the past, and then we put those in our syllabus. So instead of that, really think about what the student needs to know, and that is going to really um, kind of free you, um, because there are some things people need to know, there are some they don't, you know. So with your policies, um, you can link out to things in your policies and link out to the full policies and just kind of give them a shortened version of that. Um, have a colleague evaluate your course. I know that this can be kind of scary because once again, we're, we're afraid of failing. Um, we're afraid of looking stupid. We're afraid of looking like we don't know what we're doing. Uh, but it's really essential to grow. Um, I had a colleague who invited me into his course and had me added onto his course in Blackboard. I would definitely be willing to do that for any of you. Just let me know and we can get that sorted. Um, but yeah, have a colleague kind of come in and look at your course as they would as they would a student and give you that feedback. Um, one thing I also like to do is midterm course evaluations. So, so much of what we do over the course of the semester, we have to wait until the end really to get feedback from students, but I like to do a midterm course evaluation. So this is an example. I'm going to go ahead and click on this and it's going to pop up. So this was, uh, it asked about the secondary text that was for the class. It asked about blended format. It asked about, um, I had used Twitter in this class, and then it asked about their favorite part and what's their least favorite part and if they could change one thing. So a very simple midterm course evaluation like this could really help you um, figure out what's going right with the class and what's not going right with the class. And it can allow you to really right the ship <laughs> if there's a major issue. Um, because you're not going to necessarily hear it from students if they don't have an outlet with which to communicate with you. Okay, so let me go back. All right. So the fourth way to fail at online teaching is uh, don't, so, so this actually is incorrect, I'm so sorry, but it should be <laughs> don't be perfect. Uh, uh, be yourself. So I think kind of the opposite of the the failure thing um for a long time i thought that perfectionists were perfect and they didn't mess up and they they, they were just completely perfect but it wasn't until recently they found out no perfectionists are people who don't even start things because they're afraid that it won't be perfect so for this um do not be perfect <laughs> is the best way to succeed at online teaching. You definitely want to be yourself. Um, so I've included these bitmojis here. This is one way um, that I like to kind of inject myself into the class. Um, this might be something that's attractive for some of you who don't like to put pictures of yourself or put your face in the class, but it does allow to have it to have kind of a show my personality, you know, so definitely be yourself. Um, be warm, be compassionate, both for yourself and for your students. So online teaching requires a lot more work than face-to-face. -face. It's, it's difficult in its own unique way. Um, so be compassionate towards yourself if you're falling behind about something or um, you're not getting the work that you're expecting. You can let students know, like students can be incredibly forgiving and understanding um, I've let students know, you know, this has been a really difficult week for me, so I'm falling behind on this, but I'm, I'm dedicated that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch up by a certain time. And students really, that really resonates with students. I think that as instructors, we're kind of taught to have this professional distance. And yes, that is a good thing, but with online classes, there already is such a distance between us and the student um, that I think it's really important to remember to be human and to be compassionate. Um, another thing to remember is to be flexible within limits. So like we said before, somebody had said that they allowed unlimited uh, late work. Now what that person does is they allow uh, late work uh, for late assignments, you know, and it's really going to be up to you um, to determine what those parameters are. So be flexible, but don't be so flexible that students can take advantage. Um, so you, that's kind of like a boundary that you should have and that you should investigate for yourself. Um, so that leads me to my next slide. So don't be perfect. Students have not been completing quizzes. And if they continue to do so, they will fail the course. So this is a fact. In the chat, I want you to write a short message 
with a warm tone and personable prose reminding students to complete these assignments. So we could just say, you know, if you don't complete your assignments, you're going to fail the course. What is one way that in your voice, basically, I want to hear, hey, I need to complete this assignment, essentially. So go ahead and go in the chat and write a short message with a warm tone and personable prose reminding students to complete these assignments. Okay, so we have some um, responses that I want to read. I really liked, the one that made me um, laugh was Aaron Blythe's, which is, uh-oh, time is running out. Be sure to complete your assignments before the upcoming deadline. You can do it. It's super encouraging, you know, and it doesn't cost us anything to be kind of compassionate and kind and, and encouraging. Like, we can still maintain uh, academic rigor while being a human being, you know, um, I like some of these more personalized ones, like, hey, I noticed that you're missing X assignments. I'm concerned that if you continue doing this, it could really affect your grade. Um, I like these, I like a lot of these, how you kind of position yourself as the person that can help them. Like, I noticed this, reach out to me anytime. Thank you and best wishes. Please contact me if there's something that you need. Um, with Especially with online, we've talked about how it can kind of be really like there's a lot of distance between you and the student and this is one way you can kind of close that distance and let them know hey I understand that life happens and whatever's going on um, just let me know and I'll be able to work with you because I think a lot of students can it, it's hard for them to kind of overcome the barrier of technology and not being able to see your face and know you as a person because you know looking at you guys and reading your messages you're you're really great um, and Oh, you can see my team screen. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jennifer. Um, but it, it's one way to kind of like engage with students and remind them, yes, this is a class. And yes, I have certain expectations of you, but there's a human being behind all of this um, that, that can help you if you need the extra help. Cool. All right. Um, so the last way you can kind of fail at online teaching is to not you know, not keep improving. So take webinars and training courses and new technologies and techniques through LinkedIn and the TCC Learn Center, and you're already doing it. The fact that you're here today um, means that you're helping um, yourself, you're wanting to become a better teacher, and you're dedicated to that continuous improvement process. So right now I'm teaching uh, the Blackboard Bootcamp um, version 3.0. And every time I've done it, you know, I do a survey at the end, I get that feedback, and then I go ahead and use that for the next iteration. So definitely keep improving, definitely keep doing what you're doing, um, and you will definitely succeed at online teaching. 
So congratulations, you've completed the webinar. <laughs> Reward yourself with something nice.